Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Film Frauds, where myself, Matt, and my two co-hosts, Tyler and Mark, provide our completely unprofessional and 100% bias on the movies of today, tomorrow, and yesterday. Mark, what movie are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about 2018's Hereditary, directed by Ari Aster. Um, and this movie, the bare bones plot, I guess you could say, is uh, a family is haunted by the mysterious presence of a very secretive grandmother. And so uh, weird things happen. Weird Spoilers. things happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, this, you know, if you're watching this video, you've probably already seen it. But in case you haven't, this film is on uh, Amazon Prime Video. If you have a subscription, if you're uh, if you hail uh, Jeff Bezos and you <laughs> are an Amazon like Mark fiend, does. Yeah. like me and like all of us, because we're all They're subscribed. In relationship. Mark's like, oh, yes. I can't go back. <laughs> right, let's go back. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> definitely not a hundred books in my Amazon shopping cart. Um, <laughs> it's on Prime Video, and if you haven't seen it, uh, go watch it. And we're gonna get right into spoilers. Um, so, all right, spoilers from here on out. Tyler, what did you think? Um, I feel like I should preface my opinions on this movie by saying my least two, my two least, two least favorite genres of movies are horror movies and straight comedies. I'm often the hardest because I feel on those genres because I feel like when a horror movie fails at being a horror movie, it fails as a movie. And same with a comedy. I but I do think horror movies allow for kind of more creative kind of expression and kind of genre bending and making kind of cool visuals in a movie. I don't really like straight comedies in the slightest. So that should be a preface. But I was really curious about this movie after watching it. I'll, I'll say what I thought about it in a second of what people thought about it. So I, I entered the Reddit hive mind and I, I delved into what people thought. And there seems to be two camps for this movie. It's the next great horror movie classic. It's on par with The Exorcist, Shining. Every great horror movie, it's up there. Hereditary's there. And it's not a good scary movie. It's not really a horror movie. And I'm somewhere in the middle. I think this movie's good, but I think this movie has problems. Uh, I think primarily I have a lot of issues narratively and with the pacing of the movie. I think this movie's about 15, 20 minutes too long. That I, That's just like a base kind of generalization about it. Mm -hmm. My yeah. sentiments kind of echo Tyler's. Um, I don't think this movie is, is the greatest horror movie ever. I don't think it's a bad horror movie either. I think it's good. Pretty, I think it's solid. I think that it does have pacing issues, particularly in the second half of the movie. And I think the I think that Ari Aster was very ambitious with his themes. And by ambitious, I mean he has a lot of themes in the movie, but I don't feel like any of them were particularly paid off in a satisfying way because the movie was so loaded with like different things about family, mental illness, um, occult worshiping. Um, and I feel like none of it, although some of it was satisfying, nothing, I feel like it would have been better if they just focused on one horror element. Uh, one like one real life uh, metaphor elements of the horror. Um, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not already evident, I I love this film. <laughs> uh, I sort of agree. I, I do agree with Tyler. Where like, you know, uh, comedies and you know horror movies are really hit or miss for me. Um, and when I when I watched this for the first time, I, I watched it in 2018. Probably like when, right when it came to like uh, you know it was available to stream. Uh, I went in watching one trailer i watched uh i think the first trailer that came out and in that trailer it's sort of like focused on like the grandmother and the 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 granddaughter and i was going in expecting one type of movie like oh this is some sort of like weird grandmother ghost story i guess yep um and then when i watched the film and you know it's sort of playing out exactly how i was expecting you know you get that apparition of the grandmother and it's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, it's a ghost story, I guess. Yeah. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, the granddaughter, you know, dies horrifically. I was like, what, where's this movie gonna go? I was like, it really caught me off guard and I felt like I'd been tricked in like the best way possible. And it really surprised me. I was like, oh, this is a great instance of misdirection, I guess, and brilliant marketing on, you know, A24's part. Um, and I, I really enjoyed this movie through and through, I guess, I don't know if it's, it's, it's exactly a criticism for me. I can see why it's a, potentially a criticism for others. And it's the, uh, and I'll get this out of the way first before I like, you know, start gushing about this. And it's the, the father in the, in the movie. That's a big issue. Um, as well. Oh, yeah. I, so I didn't, I didn't mind that at all. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, on my second viewing, I'm not, I'm still 
not sure exactly how I feel on it. Um, but the father is sort of very, you know, I guess he's the anchor of the family and he's kind of stoic up, you know, through the entirety of the movie. He has one moment where he sort of shows his emotions in the car. Yeah. Um, but it's, you're sort of like feeling like, shouldn't he be reacting a little more to this? Um, but I guess for the purpose of the story, he's just the way he is and he needs to be the anchor for, you know, uh, Tony Collette's character and, and his son. Um, so I can see why that's a criticism. But for me, the, the pacing is not an issue. Uh, I, really, I really like the slow burn atmosphere, I guess you could say. Um, uh, and, you know, by the end of it, I was just like, so I was disturbed and like, you know, this is just, I was like completely wowed. Um, so yeah. Is I, there, I, what, what specifically did you guys not like? I'll start with you, Tyler. I feel like there's a couple things. One, I understand that this is more or less a family drama masking as a horror movie, but it is mm -hmm. ultimately still contains horror movie elements. There are scares, there are suspense building moments. There are even jump scares, only one or two, but there are still elements of that. It is still, despite what, and I know, listen, the director is, it's his vision, but ultimately when you put a, a piece of art out, it's kind of up for everyone's interpretations. He can say, Ari Aster can say it's a family drama, but it is a horror movie. And I think there are elements of the horror movie that don't work as well, and I wish they would have built more suspense. And I think there are stuff that were genuinely really creepy. There are two specific kind of things in the movie that I thought worked really effectively. In terms of something like the father character, when you're having, I, I think the gold standard for kind of like family implosion movies um, in a horror movie is The Witch or The Vavitch, Robert Eggers. That we're talking about later. Yeah, which Matt will be talking about. Um, I think that's the gold standard. I think that's the best horror movie of the past decade. I think it's one of the mm -hmm. better horror movies made ever. I, I, I think that's an absolutely lovely movie. And I wanted to see more of that specific implosion of the family because we do have the two, we have the one opposite end of the spectrum with Tony Collette's character, who's someone who is so consumed by grief and can't move past this and lets it consume her and take her over and kind of turns out for worse. You have the young son character who seems like there's a lot of kind of internal battling, who's clearly impacted by it, but you can see that more internally. And then the father feels like it's, he feel, it kind of feels like a second thought. Feels like all the focus was on the mother and the son. And he kind of yeah. feels like a second. And listen, I get, if it's trying to mirror real life, that's how some people process grief. They handle it stoically. But in terms of kind of thematically and narratively for the story, I thought it was a little lackluster. Mm -hmm. Matt? Um, so I didn't mind the father character. I thought it was almost like comedic how, um, how just like irrelevant he was to the story. <laughs> yeah. He's just, he's like the straight man. He's, he's the guy that you probably would relate to the most because he just doesn't know what's going on. And yeah. um, he's um, just kind of like, oh, what's the word where you don't, um, where you don't cause any controversy. I can't think of the word right now where you're um, just kind of, pa you're a passive. The op opposite of gaslighting <laughs> yeah he's, he's just he's very like passive apathetic. and yeah. um my biggest complaint with the movie is um, he's a pushover what oh yeah sort he of. Is. <laughs> my yeah. biggest complaint of the movie is kind of revolves around his character actually it's the um the dinner scene after the girl gets her head uh after the girl gets beheaded yeah. um yeah and like the the father's is like my, my, like so like again it's a family it's not really a family drama in a way because i didn't feel like the family felt realistic in this instance because like the the father's being like really on um the gift from naked brothers band side um yeah and he's it was almost like it was just so weird and i, I couldn't really understand it because it didn't feel realistic to me and then all of a sudden tony collette explodes on them he's like he's like he's, he's like you're not taking responsibility for this and it's your fault and blah 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 and but for me there was no build up to that scene that felt like that felt oh. worthy of such an explosion of emotion because it's only oh. five minutes before is when she gets her head cut off and then and then and then there's a scene of her crying at the funeral during the burial and then like the scene I think it's like maybe one or two scenes in between where he's at the where he's at the school and he's like looks like he's so disheveled he looks like he's beating himself up so in my mind I'm saying oh he's taking this really seriously like clearly he's very bothered by this and then the scene after that is Tony Collette exploding on him about how you're not taking responsibility but it's like from what I've seen he's taking he's taking this really hard like I couldn't really get into her character at the time that was probably my biggest complaint I, of the movie. I have one I have one thing I want to say about the dinner scene it's not necessarily responding to what you said but it's actually another issue a slight kind of nitpicky issue um we have shown i it's not that that scene from the daughter's death to the dinner scene is not a five minute 
difference. It's actually yeah. closer to 2025. And I thought that dinner scene where she explodes on the sun should have been much closer to death. I, I think there are some kind of like structural issues with the movie. And I think that's one of my glaring ones because we see her clearly mourning. We see her clearly still uh, grieving over the death of her grandmother, even though that's a little complex. Um, and now it's this buildup of emotion. But we as audience members witnessed 25 minutes of a movie go by where it's realistically because – but what, regardless of what happens in the movie um, with the cult and if it was all purposeful or it was all planned or whatever, the son is directly right, the son is directly responsible for the daughter's death. Yeah. Or not directly, but he is a cause of it. And you mm-hmm. expect there to be that blow up. Like, you caused this a lot sooner. So you, you, I wanted that anger, that kind of raw anger right as it was happening yeah. because then I, it would have felt more realistic to me. Well, I, 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 I want to like interject about, here. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think what this could be a, a fault in the movie. And I, I think I picked this up on the second viewing, not on the first. I think the, the passage of time is not exactly clear because I think the explosion, the time between the, the beheading and the, the dinner scene, I think it's like, you know, like one or two months, I think. Is so it? I think so. I'm not, I'm not completely I sure. Know. I think, you know, I guess the way the movie could have displayed that would have been like, you know, you get those like uh, outside shots of the home. I guess you could show like the weather, that, you know, like now it's fall or now it's yeah. like winter or something. Um, but I think there's a, a passage of time there. But it's sort of explained in the film that there's this uh, wall between the this, this son and the mother, you know, after the whole paint thinner incident. Yeah. Um, and so that for me, that dinner scene is you know, I was completely, I, I bought into it. And I think it was extremely re- realistic that in terms of escalation and how the characters reacted. Cause I think the son is a little more, you know, he's not as emotional, I guess, because, the, because of that passion of uh, passage of time, he sort of had his time to deal with it. And, you know, then there's the whole element of the wall between them and, you know, this, all this time has passed with this tension between them and they haven't really let it out. And this, yeah. the explosion that happens is just, I think it's completely earned. And I didn't have a single gripe with it. But like every scene with him between the, 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 the burial and the, the dinner scene is him like sweating and his hair's all disheveled and he, he's smoking with his friends and he can't even hear what they're saying because he's so, he and, he's, and he has like, down, and he, yeah. he thinks he's having um, uh, a panic attack or whatever. And they're like, yeah. oh, you want to call a hot? He says he can't breathe. So like you yeah. see him, I feel like the movie would have been better if um, if like the, the climax of the movie was the dinner scene and everything between that was um, Tony Collette just stewing and stewing about about uh, Naked Brothers Band Guy not, um, not, not um, saying his guilt. I feel like you, you could have made a more interesting horror movie out of that or a more suspenseful, um, as Ari Aster, Ari Aster says, family drama out of that. And then it seemed like he wanted to get to the occult stuff. And I feel like the more interesting movie would have been the, just the, the, the dealing with the guilt. Cause I feel like everything the movie showed me between the, the burial scene and that dinner scene is that, is that he's obviously like really guilty about this. And I didn't feel like he really deserved to get the lashing out. That he did. I feel like then you need to be more scenes of Tony Collette of him, of him, Tony Collette giving him the chance to confess and him not doing it. So in terms of structure on this scene, are we like all over the place? Because I want it sooner, you want it later, and Mark thinks it's perfect right where it is. Yeah, we're all over the place. We're all over the place with this. Yeah. I just think, because what you're saying about that kind of raw emotion, I I think based on what we got in the movie, it would have boiled over faster. Uh, but But I understand the placement of it, and I also understand having it be kind of like the penultimate climactic family drama point of the scene, um, which is interesting, which I, I think is a kind of yeah. really kind of cool thing. interesting. Also, the Naked Brothers fan guy, his name is Alex Wolf. Um, I just wanted to throw that there mainly because I, I looked up the actor. But I, I wanted to talk about one thing of this, and Ari Aster is clearly a very, if you look at any behind-the-scenes interview of any of the actors say, they say Ari Aster is the most prepared director they've ever worked with. Tony Collette said that in an interview, that she's never seen a director uh, more prepared for the movie. Um, I feel like Ari Aster does not know what to show and what not to show. There are a few instances of this. I think this might be spoiling my Hallmark scene in the movie, but my favorite scene in the movie is the beheading, um, kind of that focus on the shock and the horror of the kid. I yeah. didn't, but, but I didn't need to see the skull. I didn't need to see the rotting skull. 
But there's another time in the movie where you see, spoilers, the father on fire, and it cuts far too quickly to kind of let the horror of it settle in. All right, and then you, but then you have a really good instance later where Tony Collett is cutting off her own head, and you hear it thump in the background. Ari Aster is seeming to flip on what at least I liked and what I didn't want to see and what I wanted to see. I wanted to see more of the father on fire to witness the horror. We kind of got the, um, the what's it called? The, uh, the reference or the uh, allusion to what had happened when you hear, you, like we see her hit this head, hit the pole, and that's all the horror we need because the horror is focused on the reaction. I didn't need the shot of the rotting skull because now I visualized it and it's less terrifying. It made it tangible. But then we have it at the end where he clearly knows what he's doing or kind of fixes that and shows it off screen. So instead of like seeing like the decapitated body, but we do see it a little bit after, but we just hear the thump and you can just fill in the gaps. Like you fill off because you saw her cutting it and you saw the blood. You kind of fill in the gaps. I feel like there's that weird like mix that he has there. I don't know what you guys thought about that. Well, well, uh, you, you know, in the final scene in the, uh, the tree house, you know, yeah. uh, Charlie's head is like on the payment statue. I wish that was the first time we saw it. I, I you wish I, that was okay. I okay. don't think I don't. Because you'd rec would you be able to recognize that immediately? You'd be like, oh, that's where it is. Well, yeah, because we just witnessed because we saw the grandmother's body decapitated, and we saw the mother's body decapitated, and we know that the daughter's body was de decapitated. I just think it takes away visualizing the horror takes away from the genuine horror of the scene because the okay. horror of the scene comes from the realization as an audience that. This little girl, I think she's 13, just decapitated herself. And you witness that on the brother's reaction where he refuses to look back. And it, that's a wonderfully like frame shot where the brake lights are illuminating everything red. And he's just in shock and he's, the tears are starting to form, but he refuses to look back. That's horrifying. Yeah. Horrifying. It's terrifying. But it's, but it's not terrifying because we see what happened. And I think that little reveal ru uh, ruins it. And then you have where the father's on fire. It's a quick on fire cut. And you're like, no, but that's kind of like, that's like the build up horror I want to see. Because that's like, you throw it in, he catches on fire. And I want that horror to kind of settle in a little bit. So you'd wish that shot of him on fire was slightly longer? Yeah. Or do you wish it, that like, like, you know, she throws it in the fire, she turns around and then it's like her face like in horror. And then you just like, it's the implication. And then it yeah. cuts and yeah, holds would, and then I it cuts back to her. I would have rather, because again, these are like little nitpick criticisms, but I feel like they're kind of representative of some of the issues as a whole. Um, yeah. There's a lot of uh, the mixture between showing and telling, or kind of yeah. showing and visualizing. Because we do get that shot of her face where she's in horror. And if yeah. we had just gone that, it kind of it goes in line with the, theme, like the, the style of the movie, where horrible things are left to the audience's imagination, and that's what's horrible about them. But instead, we get that cut of the head, the, cut of, the quick shot of the fire, but then it fixes at the end where you get the head kind of tumbling off in the background. That might just yeah. be my kind of nitpicks with horror movies in general. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys thought. Matt, do you have any issues with that? Or um, No, I didn't. I thought the head was disturbing. I thought that it served a purpose. It didn't like bother me at all seeing it. I thought I liked, I liked like the harsh cut to it as well. Like there's no like real build up to it. Just like it's like, bam, there it is. Yeah. And then I, I, think, I, I think you hear uh, Tony Collette like just like wailing in the background. And I, yeah. I don't know, that scene really disturbed me. I thought, I thought that it was effective. Um, what was the other scene you're talking about? The fire. The fire. The fire. Uh, I don't know, Tony, Collette, Tony Collette's reaction was so great that it didn't bother me. Okay. Like, I don't I, understand that scene either. Like, I don't understand. Was that, like, the moment where she just broke mentally and then the spirit consumed her? Yes. I think uh, it was, yeah. Yeah, it's like the, the, the glowing spirit of Payman. Um, I think that's when it, and I think that's when it kind of possessed her. Is that is that was that caused by burning the book? I think that was. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it, you know, it says in, it says in the movie that he that Heyman's like the, the god of mischief or something, and um, wisdom and mischief, I think. Was yeah, so you know, I think, I guess it's sort of a twist where you know the book goes into the fire and Tony Collette thinks she's gonna burn to death, but it's really just a role reversal. It's like I guess it's sort of like you know the mischief coming into play. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to talk about the, oh, well, first thing, let's, let's get something out of the way. Tony Collette is a powerhouse in this yeah, film. Yeah, this is like she, one of the best. She didn't, even get, she didn't even get a, like, a nomination. Like, I, I'm, so, I'm so confused. Yeah, for she Guessing was, Game, I have written down who else got nominations for this year, and there's like one or two where it's like, oh. Like, yeah, she absolutely should have yeah. been nominated. Yeah, you think of, but, uh, um, 
I'm sorry, you go. Uh, I just want to address two things. Uh, well, that, talking about the head on the on the ground and the pavement, um, I sort of align more with, with Matt's uh, view of it. Um, I think I would have agreed with you, Tyler, if he's in the car and, you know, he's like processing it and then it cuts to the head. I but don't want to see like, the head at all. I, I already... You don't because, want to see the head at all? Because the movie places such an emphasis on focusing on his grief and shock, that's enough for me to be horrified. That's enough for me to go, oh my God, clearly this is just like monumental and horrible. Well, it does serve a purpose though. And it's because uh, you get that shot of the head and the ants are crawling all over it. Yep. And then you get that dream sequence later on where Tony Collette is sleepwalking and she sees the ants going into, uh, you know, her son. Yeah. Oh, wait, that is that like a thematic similarity to Old Boy? Oh my God! In oh old my boy, God! The ants are kind of same like, universe confirmed. What old boy and hereditary are in the same universe? Because in yeah. old boy, I think they're representative of kind of like loneliness and insanity. Oh my I God! We did. I think it's like it. yeah, it's like one of those up for interpretation oh. thematics, or maybe it's some sort of deep rooted. And then you know, ants, two thousand two. <gasps> by Woody <laughs> Allen. Oh my! Oh my God. God! It's all coming together. Wait, Woody Allen? What? Didn't what? Woody Allen? Isn't Woody Allen in or something? I mean, mean, Woody Allen? What, you mean Woody Harrelson? Are you getting them interchanged? Are again? you getting mixed up again? <laughs> I'm looking it up. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel, uh, like, I feel like there are a few, like, listen, I'm dogging on this movie a lot, but this movie is genuinely, like, it's yeah. a good movie. Like, we, again, performances, there's a, it's technically and visually and directing wise, it's yeah. wonderful. What did you think of um, Finn, Nate Wolf's well, acting? Alex Wolf. Oh. Woody Allen is in Ants. Is he? Really? Suck what? it. Suck wow. it. <laughs> oh my what? god, he is. He's what did he I play? was right. Uh, um, yeah, what did you think of Nate? Uh, Alex acting? Wolf. Alex Wolf's acting. I, I thought it was great. I think it really, really comes out to play in the car scene. And then yeah. uh, the scene underneath the bleachers. Um, the classroom scene. I, I can just list every scene. But also, I think... The two scenes where it's just, I was just blown away is where uh, Tony Collette's sitting at the, end of the end, edge of his bed, and he's like, why did you want me, you know, why didn't you want me? And then later on when he's like, you know, Tony Collette's like banging her head against the, the, yeah. the, the attic, and, she, and he's just pleading, he's like, mommy! Yeah, I thought blown he went, went a little over the top in some scenes. That's, uh, I, I think he's a wonderful at subtle and yes, like facial. Like the subtle, like, <laughs> like I was dying when, um, like in two scenes, like in early on, like he plays, he plays a good teenager really yeah. well. Like when he's talking to Tony Collette and he's, and he's like, he's like, Hey, can I get the car to go to this barbecue thing? He's like, is there going to be Party. alcohol? He said, he said, well, no. He's like, he's like, can you bring your sister? He's like, do you, does he want to go? Like kind of like, you know, like how like, how like, like a, like an angsty teen and their mom would talk, like kind of like when they answer their questions with other questions. First off, like, I just want to throw something out there. What mom wants to take a 13 year old? Why is he, te- why is, does the mom want her to go? Well, she thought it was a barbecue. Well, she didn't, no, he, well, she no, didn't he know he it was a barbecue though. He, no, he says party in it. Hey, can I well, go Well, I think he's just so desperate well, for her to, sure, to make yeah. friends that, yeah, uh, like, okay. yeah. just do something. And then, and then when and then the heart cuts to him in the car driving her and he has, and he has like this fucking bullshit look on his face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, like he was brilliant there. Like I thought he was really, really good. And then like some of the horror scenes I thought he was good in as well. But like sometimes he just get, he just went a little too much for me. There are there's um, that one with the Ouija board kind of like seance where he's kind of like a little too over the top for me. Because, I yeah, I agree with that. because he has to then like show like genuine fear and kind of like exasperation and terror. Yeah. Vocally, not kind of like facially like expressions. He is on par with Tony Collette in this movie. He is so goddamn good with that. That kind of like subtle fear. Like uh, in the final scene in the attic when he like turns around and there's just terror in his eyes. Wonderful. But then he has to like say some stuff and you're like, eh. kind of like, it's kind of a little underwhelming. Yeah. I still think he, yeah. He, he, he still does I mean, if you, if, if you can contend with Tony Collette in a, in a movie where she's just given this absolute ridiculous performance, you know, yeah. really says something. Um, I want to just talk about the, the directing and the cinematography. I love the way this film is shot. I think it's brilliant, and I can see definitely where Ari Aster draws inspiration. Um, one shot in particular I was uh, particularly aware of, um, and it's when uh, it, his, her son is biking home, and it's night, and it follows him up the driveway, and he puts the bike down, and then the, the camera goes, and it shows Tony Collette in the car, 
Yep. And then it goes above the car and it turns. And you see and you see him standing in front of the house, like trying to, you know, get the, the courage to go inside. And um and then he goes inside and Tony Clett drives off. That seemed like a very sort of Martin Scorsese esque shot or like an Andre Tarkovsky shot where like the camera is just meandering and it's just sort of like omnipotent and it just uh it's just sort of just showing you very slowly what's going on and it was like I could just see like oh that's that's where he got that from and I know from a podcast that um you know Ari Aster is a big fan of Tarkovsky and have definitely very Tarkovsky-esque and then um uh you know definitely some allusions to Kubrick as you mentioned uh Matt you know definitely reminiscent of The Shining where you get those shots of Tony Collette you know that. in horror yeah I haven't seen The Shining oh is he <laughs> I mentioned The Shining you haven't seen The Shining what no. <laughs> he's gonna kill you man <laughs> I think we lost Mark I, I mean, yeah. well guys there's a last episode of film frauds <laughs> okay well sorry Tyler we're like the naked you, brothers band we're like the naked brothers band breaking up <laughs> yeah uh yeah definitely definitely like you know obviously it looked sort of like Shelley Duvall in The Shining. Um, so, and then a lot of the shots are like dollies in. Um, and, and then the, the, you know, every once in a while, it's sort of fra- like the shots are framed like a dollhouse. Yeah. You know, the cult <sighs> is like sort of moving the dolls around because they're controlling everything. I mean, like the pole has the sign on it. There's the deer. Yeah. You know, everything's like prearranged like a dollhouse. I yeah. thought that was brilliant. Yeah. And then you get like the, the tilt shift shots of the house. Yep. And I just thought, mm, I loved it. I love the way this film is shot. Yeah, I uh, I mean, you just kind of mentioned my main point. There's a lot of, like, parallels, too, because Tony Collette's character is kind of like a, a doll showcaser, like a, a model kind of house builder and kind of things like that. Um, and a lot of the house and a lot of the settings and a lot of kind of the shots in which the camera moves mimic how kind of those houses look, where oftentimes it feels like – you ever see, like, a sitcom – and there's only like the three walls and that one wall is never shown because that's where like the stage is. And it feels very much like mm-hmm. that. Like we're kind of peering into yeah. know, someone's lives. It's kind of, again, a tie to old boy where it's kind of that themes of kind of like invasion. And we kind of feel like we're witnessing an event we shouldn't be witnessing. And it feels very personal. I mean, all of that is wonderful in the movie. I mean, I know I'm kind of like dogging on the movie a lot. Uh, but I mean, this movie is like masterfully directed at times. I, I think there's some yeah. wonderfully, wonderfully done stuff. And mm. our, I, I haven't seen Midsommar. I know Midsommar is a little bit longer than that. But I do feel like, listen, I I like slow burn horror movies. I mean, this could also be like a discussion and where this falls under. Like, it, because there are now like two camps of horror movies. Matt said it a while back, but you have the big blockbuster jump scare extravaganzas, the insidious, the it chapter one and two. And then you have the slow, somber, slow burning, suspenseful movies. You have hereditary, you have black coat's daughter, you have the Vavitch. Um, and that the, the latter is definitely my kind of cup of tea, but I do think this movie is like 15, 20 minutes too long. I think this should have been an hour 40. I think there's a lot of like the slow, like moving you could have cut to kind of increase the pacing a little bit to kind of build that suspense a little bit more quickly Mm -hmm. i don't know matt you seem to be the only one other one with pacing issues what do you think um it's one of those movies where i feel like it was um i guess i guess i said earlier with it had too many it was trying to tackle too many themes and i think that um movie could have been shorter if it just tackled if it just kind of kept focused and yeah it definitely felt long so towards the second half it sort of left reality for me so it kind of felt like it was going slower like I was trying to figure out where it was going not that an unpredictable movie is bad but it seemed like it was it just seemed kind of like meandering at times and um I would definitely say it went too long but I also think that in some cases it didn't go long enough because I didn't feel like they satisfyingly tackled all the themes that they were setting up what do you guys uh, what do you guys think about this movie as a horror movie do you think it works as a horror movie are there enough kind of scares yeah or kind of um Do you guys have, like, I have one, I have, like, one and a half. One legitimately really freaked me out. I don't know if you guys had any. What what was Um, the scariest part of this movie for you? Well, one's, like, my Hallmark scene. I don't know if I want to get into that. We can do, uh, we can do Hallmark scenes and kind of talk about it if you guys want. Well, I'll answer your question. I'll answer your question now, Tyler. Just because I have, it's not Hallmark's, well, I have a lot of Hallmark scenes, but this is probably, like, the lower tier of the Hallmark scenes. And it's when... Uh, after the husband is, has died in the fire and 
the mother's possessed and uh, the son wakes up and as soon as he wakes up and I just know he's alone in the house and the, the cult members everywhere and as well as this god of mischief, um, I was like, oh my god, I was horrified. I was like, he is in for some shit. Yep. And then it cuts to him waking up and then you see like Tony Clett in the background like this. Yep. Up in the ceiling and then he's like just sort of like looking around. He looks out at the 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 tree house, you see the lights on, and then yep. you see the motion light come on. Yep. And and then it sort of shows Tony Collette a little bit more. And then he like he senses something wrong and he's turning around. And then she like without any noise, she flies out of the room. I was like, oh my god, it freaked me the hell out. And then you know, he goes downstairs and then you see like the guy standing in the corner like this. He's, that, he's he the guy at the at the funeral at the in the beginning yeah. too. Like he's right, right. face. See that the yeah. the way that shot is framed, I, like the Tony Collette stuff didn't really scare me, but it's that one where he where it's framed where Tony Collette's over his left shoulder and the empty dark door is on his right. And you think he's going to turn to face Tony Collette, but instead he turns the other way and you see like the naked old man, but he's not fully in the light. He's like a little bit in the darkness. And he just his, like face is illuminated. Yeah. He just kind of, it's like very much like parasite um, where it's just like the yeah. white of the eyes and the smile are illuminated, but it's just dark enough where you're like, is that real? Like, is that a real person? Is that a ghost? And it's, the way it's like fram freaked me out like so much. That one really got me. That one I was like, oh, that one got me a lot. I think yeah. the scene that freaked me out the most was when uh, he wakes when uh, the naked brothers van guy wakes up and <laughs> I don't know why I keep referring to him as that. <laughs> when he when he wakes up in the middle of the night and he sees uh, his sister's sister in the corner. Yeah. And oh, yeah, then like yeah. her head just like falls forward yeah. and it just comes yeah. off and then it but ends up being like the, the basketball or whatever i was like yeah. i was just drinking milk at the time like just casually i was like watching it and then the head fell and i almost threw up for some reason <laughs> like it's almost triggered like this really weird response yeah. on me. <laughs> are you that's often, my hallmark scene because that almost gave me a gag reflex but, um, are you often waking up in the middle of the night and there are little girls standing in your corner with heads falling off is that is that what happens to you <laughs> No, it happens so response. infrequently that when it happened in the movie, it just completely <laughs> caught me off guard. Um, I don't know. My hallmark scene is, I mean, that's probably the scariest scene of the movie for me. That quick little flash of the grandma in the darkness. Oh, that's like yeah. 12 that was minutes good. in, I was like, oh, ooh, oh, I don't like that. Um, oh, when yeah. he turns the light on? Yeah. Yeah. And you just kind of say, she's like there by the dollhouse and she just kind of looks evil. But it's only a quick, I wish there was more of that, honestly. So it's like a horror movie. I was like, oh, people are just scary. In They're general. just scary. They just remind me of death, and I don't like it. It's so wrinkly. Why don't you, just wrinkly. Get, young? <laughs> Why don't you just get younger again? Um, I think this. I th I think my hallmark scene is probably the the car sequence. Just like the how it just kind of follows him, and he lies down in his bed. That's like an eight minute sequence, but it's kind of all one scene. He lays down in the bed, and then like it just focuses on his eyes, and then you wake up and you hear Tony Collette screaming wonderful like exploration of like shock and grief and how you just sometimes you just yeah. like, process it and you just don't know what to do um mm -hmm. i thought that was really good mark do you have a favorite scene yes i have i i know my favorite scene is and i i just oh, i love it um it's when tony collette sleepwalks and she's uh it's like it's the sleepwalk she dreams about sleepwalking and she like goes into her son's room and like they have that argument and he's like why didn't you want me he's like she's like i never wish i was your mother like yeah. that and then like they have that 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 discussion and it starts heating up and then it cuts to her son and he's just drenched and then it cuts to her and she's drenched and they're both drenched in paint thinner and then yeah. and then she wakes up i was like oh that's so good i was so good i was it was horrifying and um i just i think just the way ari aster narratively structured the escalation in this film i think he did it masterfully I thought it was phenomenal. I have like you guys were talking about pacing. I have no issues with the pacing. I did not feel the length of this movie, um, and I felt everything was earned, except maybe the, the anything regarding the dad. But yeah. um, even then, it's still I'm I'm still like fifty fifty on it. So. But I feel like I feel like that revelation has never paid off at all in a satisfying way. That the revelation of the cult? of that he ne that he never wanted. The, he never wanted him. Well, it's it's the reason why there's a divide between them because he thinks that she wants. But to there's, kill there's never like a confrontation, like a real confrontation, you know. Yeah, but I mean, it's like a pseudo confrontation, but it's a confrontation nonetheless. But it happened in a dream, so like the guy, the kid never realizes this. I feel like it could have actually that's had a like good point. A impact on the story. Like what I don't know. I don't. Like? I don't consider. I don't consider something that's in a dream that's never actually brought up in the reality of the movie to be like a real confrontation. Like nothing's that solved from it. 
because now we're just getting like an internal manifestation of her yeah. guilt. That's what I mean when I say the movie tackles so many themes. It's like it was like so. What was ultimate? How that ultimately pay off at the end of the movie? That's a good and point, actually. Yeah, that's a good from point. What I can yeah. tell. Wow, Matt, look at you. Yeah, that was a good point. Matt's good coming for a reaster. Damn. Um, well, yeah. I, I like the. I, I want to say I like the movie, but um, that was one of my. That's one of my biggest gripes is that he just is too ambitious with his script. Do you guys have any Mark sleepy time moments? If you guys are new, Mark falls asleep watching a lot of movies and still give him good grades. So instead of our hey, our least favorite moments of the movie, please call them Mark sleepy time moments. I have uh, one. What do you guys have? No sleepy time for me. No Mark, sleepy. Marky time. Mark was awake the whole time. Oh my god. <laughs> Matt, I think just generally in the second half. Um, not that not that I was bored, but it seemed a little wandering. Um, but like, there's no like bad scene. I would say. I have one that is not as creepy as I think they want it to be, and it's when he gets possessed in the school and breaks his nose. I kind of laughed a little bit during that uh, because we like shoots his hand up and he's like that. Also, like yeah, but did you did you did, did you get did you get why he did that? I I mean it just it was comical. You, well, if you look at if you looked at the statue at the end of Payman, yeah, his hands exactly like that. But why is Payman breaking his nose? Like, what's going on there? Like, Payment is a god. He's he's like it. He just does mischievous things because the movie needs to happen. Whatever. Shut up. Who cares? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, for me, it was one of those things where it's like, look, the horror can get him anywhere. Like, ooh, like, look at the impact of it. But just, like, the presentation of it and the fact that it's, like, in a public setting, in a school. And I try to, like, picture what it'd be like there if a kid just, like, did like that and then smashes it. I'd be more like, eh, what the fuck? Like, what is this kid? What is, it? What is a Naked Brothers Band kid doing today? I mean, um, wasn't that not horrifying when he's like this and then the camera really. like dollars in really fast? I, I thought it was a little I horrifying. Thought it was, I, 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 I thought, thought it was horrifying. Yeah. I was more creeped out by the fact when he like looks at the glass and like in the thing smiling back at him because that I think like reflections are kind of creepy. Like if you look in your Especially your reflection. Oh. <laughs> oh no, I set that one up. Five, Matt. I five. <laughs> I set that one up. Um god damn it. That's I was story. going on the podcast highlights. No. <laughs> Bringing him back. <laughs> Tyler gets eviscerated, dead. Um, yeah. yeah, that was that was probably the one scene where I was like, it didn't work for me. I don't yeah. think it, I don't think it hit the intended impact. Um, there's like this is like also like a movie details like wet dream. There is so many oh, things yeah. like like Charlie oh, yeah. is like very clearly like payment from the very beginning. There's the illusions like Tony Klutz family. They're all dead and probably because of the the demon or whatever. And there's that thing where it's like, oh, when she possesses Tony Klutz little weird girl that she kind of sounds different she sounds like a normal girl so it's like oh my god that was probably her for the first time we're probably witnessing yeah Heyman thingamabob there's a lot of like little details I don't know like it's just like I think the movie's too long I think there's not like I kind of agree with Matt there's just like there's not enough to it for me didn't it just didn't like hit that mark there's a lot but it just not, nothing for me well at least a lot of it just didn't pay off in any satisfying like the movie has depth i'm not gonna deny it but it just doesn't it's like it's like it's like a it's like a whole big field that is like a couple inches deep rather than like a small backyard that's like that has like feet. you mean like a pool like it's a giant pool that's on the sh- it's all shallow yeah that's that's a much so like better metaphor yeah than my stupid one <laughs> Your stupid field it's the earth it's the earth this goes off oh my god it's terrible uh, um what'd you guys think of the ending I mean, it's it's like in line with what was happening in the movie. Like nothing yeah. really surprised me. Um, I feel like they could have like I keep going back. Like it could have like for Ari Aster's family drama. Like there's so many elements. Like be like I want not. I never wanted to have you. Um, I'm not. I I am not accepting my guilt and killing my sister. Like there's so much good family drama and suspense. I could have made this horror movie kind of like The Witch, but instead it just goes to cults, demons, uh, possession. I don't know. Like I, I liked it, and I thought like the imagery at the end was disturbing. Like when it when it pans out, it's just like it's like a black void, yeah. and it kind of looks yeah. like a dollhouse kind of thing there. But this movie could have been more unique. It could have been like the next Vavage and its psychological drama. But then it just kind of becomes another oh can, demons. So, 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 I, but saying, it did. It handles it much better than than a generic horror movie. There, I want to clarify that. Did you guys expect? I feel like the ending was not. There was a slight change to the ending. I feel like that was supposed to be. There's a lot of illusions oh yeah here. i know what you're talking about there's like constant like his eyes are scratched out in photos i feel mm-hmm. like there is an ending where he had his eyes ripped out oh there is then, i know what it is is there an, uh, another ending where his eyes are like gouged out like because so 
Because they're constantly, like, his photo has the eyes scratched out. There's the drawings. Like, these guys are getting yeah. gouged out. I was yeah, so it. I think if I if I think this is sort of like a rumor, I don't know if it's exactly confirmed, but I, I read this, and it's that, um, Where'd you read I it? think, what do you think? <laughs> um, okay. it, it was, I think, yeah, Pinterest. Yeah. Um, I think it's that they created the film and they, they showed a 24 had shown it to a test audience. And in that, in this version, there's no, uh, it's just like, he's gouging his eyes out at the end, I think in the attic, but it didn't, that, that didn't really fly well with like the test audiences. So they change it. So he just sort of comes out and he stands Lame. there. And then there's like that, like sort of like that Wikipedia summary of like, what's going to happen following yeah. the end of the movie of like yeah. who, who he is and where they're talking what's off happen. screen. Yeah. Where it's yeah, the, yeah. And the actress. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the switch that was made. Um, so, but you know, again, I, I kind of like the ending. We got more, I guess. Uh, I feel like the, the eyes gouging out would be a, just a, a tiny bit too much for me. I think, you know, we got a thirteen-year-old you know, can... girl whose head got decapitated on a pole because she was well, dying. Well, she wasn't. He was say, ugly, so it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I do. I do much better with the implication of gore, but not seeing gore. Like I, I if if that that would be like more, I'd just be like this. I couldn't watch, it. especially like you know when Tony Collette's like cutting her head off with a piano wire. Like that, I was like, how oh, do people know oh, it's a piano wire? Where did we get that? Yeah, the I, piano, pick, I thought they had like, like, like knives. The piano. You hear the, the the piano. You see it on the ground when he goes goes downstairs. But before he goes downstairs, you hear the piano noise and like the the wires are being ripped out. Oh, you hear it. I because I looked it up and it's like yeah, she's cutting her head off with a piano wire. I'm like, where the fuck did they get a piano well, from? I'll give it. I'll 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 say that I didn't pick that up the first time I watched it. But between you know this my first viewing and the second viewing, I read that as well. And then like uh you know it became clear to me once I saw it the second time. So it's not exactly evident on your first watch. But again, I like to say I really like the ending. I like the way, it, you know, it was handled. Um, I know there was an alternate version that was probably more, you know, in line with what Ari Aster's vision was, but I'm still very satisfied. Yeah, I listen, I mean, like, again, I'm dogging on this movie a lot, but that's just because I said in the beginning, I'm a lot harder on horror movies. I do like horror movies. Um, again, the Vavitch, it might not be my- Stop character. calling it that. Stop have, calling it that. It's how it looks, the Vavitch. No, but it's, it's a stylistic version of, like, what old- Ye old English looks like, but it's the witch. <laughs> it's the witch. Do not call the, the witch. The the Stop it's calling it that. I'm so you and you guys and all these fucking redditors. <laughs> you love calling it the bavitch, and I can't stand it. It's, it's a stylus. It's doing the movie the way I want to. Roger Eggers is my friend. I paid to Robert see Robert Eggers. <laughs> Robert Eggers. Okay. Whatever. Not Roger Eggers. It's not Roger Ebert Eggers. God. <laughs> that's that's Alex's thing. Alex said that. It's Roger Eggers. No. It's the witch, okay? So everybody the, wants this. Do not call it the the witch. So it's in the, the witch. witch um, what was I saying? My point. You just went off on a rant. What was my point? What was I just <laughs> I saying? Know. It didn't matter. It didn't I matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Oh no. Okay. So the witch is. Oh, so I love the witch. It's not my top ten of the decade, but if I were to make a top twenty, it'd be in there. Um, Same. I do an like. Mention? Yeah, I do like horror movies. Uh, I'm I'm a, like I'm a legitimate fan of like the first two Insidious movies. I think Insidious Chapter Two is like a really great movie and underrated. Um, and I do think this is a good movie. I just think it has problems, I, and I don't think it's this the next coming of The Shining or Exorcist. It's not like the resurrection of the horror movie genre. I just think it's a good horror movie. I think it's one of the better ones of the decade. Yeah. Um, I also so so Tyler. I know you watched Rosemary's Baby. I know I you did. haven't seen it yet, uh, Matt, but. You, you see why I told you to check that out? Well, yeah, it's the it's kind of like, well, Rosemary's Baby is basically like a commentary on kind of like society and the impression of, uh, oppression of women. But as a whole, it's basically like gaslighting the movie. It's kind of like- Yeah, the, right. The, it's the outside influence impacting like the, the nuclear family household. Um, right, right, right. And, and kind of like that, that slow evil influence taking over and- and I mean, yeah, it's very clearly with the influence of the cult that it's very much a callback to Rosemary's Baby. There's also a reference to Rosemary's Baby in Black Coat's Daughter. Um, it's just like, I get why it's a classic movie and I can clearly see the influences after watching it. So comparing it to Hereditary, what, which movie would you, would you like, prefer to watch again? Rosemary's Baby, 100%. Rosemary's Baby really? is a phenomenal movie. Yeah, yeah, Rosemary's Baby is like, it, I, I think Rosemary's Baby trumps like a probably up there in one of the best five horror movies of all time. I, I think also uh -huh. because, like Matt's saying, 
this movie tackles a lot of ideas, but doesn't necessarily do it, doesn't necessarily tackle them to fulfillment. Rosemary's Babies tackles like three ideas. It's the uh-huh. it's the oppression of women in like a patriarchal society. It's like gaslighting, and it's like, but and it's kind of like um, kind of like the, a commentary on religion as a whole. But all of those serve to that one purpose of oppressing Mia Farrow's character. It's not yeah. like it's not like all these ideas and it's not tackling them. It's three main ideas and how they impact one character, which yeah. I which I yeah. think that Hereditary is. A lot of ideas attacking a family, but they're, the ideas aren't as fleshed out. A Rosemary's Baby, 100%. Even if yeah, it's slightly okay. longer. Yep. I agree. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> all right. Before, do we guys have any final points before we get to guessing game? I think um, I've I just like the piece. scene. Um, I just like the scene where um, after the father's emotional breakdown and then he's driving up to, he's driving up to the driveway. Yeah. And Tony Clutt's like, <laughs> like yeah. this, and then she tries again to stop, and he just rolls his eyes and keeps yeah. driving. And she's following him with the book. I don't yeah, know. That yeah. was really funny. Like it was yeah. purposely funny. I think, like yeah. obviously, Ari Aster's really good at like subtle, like real life human conversations that I yeah. think that are, yeah. I just like yeah. that, and like what I mentioned earlier between like the mom and the son when he's trying to go to the party, like yeah. things like that. I think are funny. He has a pretty thought, good sense of humor when he when he decides to use it. I thought the music was good in the movie too. There's a lot of music in this movie. The movie's like seventy five percent music like there's not yeah. a lot of like scenes without a score behind it which i thought was really cool i thought the score was so good and obviously in the final scene that 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 uh song or, or that melody is very popular now i think it's like in a bunch of you know tiktoks and meme videos i guess well you um, are the you are the resident tiktok lover yeah of them i don't i don't oh, I don't have tiktok mark what's your tiktok Tyler, handle? I, I, I swear. <laughs> but, what's uh, your TikTok um, handle so we can follow you I, I don't have a TikTok. I've never downloaded it. You're it's so drums cool. up. No I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not. I don't. Go watch. Go no. listen to me dance. That was no, good. Stuff, I don't. Mark. That was really good. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't have a TikTok. But uh, yeah. I wanted to say, <laughs> Mark's showing real comedic timing there. Damn. Um, you. I see you guys are. You know, have, have gripes this movie in regards to like Ari Aster's juggling a lot of things. I'm very interested to see what you think of Midsummer, um, because. It's a longer film. I think, Ugh. I think Hereditary is much better than Midsummer, but Midsummer does some aspects, you know, that are just you know phenomenal. But there's so many things going on in that film. I feel like that it's really easy to have a gripe with it. Like I, like I prefer Hereditary every single day of the week to Midsummer. Um, but some people are like, I absolutely love Midsummer and I fucking hated Hereditary. And then it's like there's the other camp. And I'm sort of in that other camp. And it's like, there's really, a, div- I guess, a divide there. Um, so I think eventually at some point we should definitely talk about that film because yeah. it's a film worth discussing. And it's comparing it to Hereditary, there's a lot of similar things being dealt with. Yeah. Um, so uh, definitely check that out soon. No, I'm, I'm interested. Listen, I, I also don't think, I, I also don't really recognize how someone could hate this movie. I think there's enough really great stuff in this movie. Like things yeah. tackled really well that I don't really like. When someone says it's a bad horror movie, it's not, or it's a bad movie, yeah. it's not. People, people, do you, do you know what the uh, cinema score is for uh, the witch? No, don't spoil it. No, because that was one of my favorite oh. guessing game. You bastard. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, but you while we're on that, it. let's go to. Uh, well, you're not going to answer that, but Matt will guess that one. All right, okay. uh, we're going to go to the guessing game. This is when I spend about 35 seconds finding internet trivia to try to trick you guys into getting some self satisfaction about my life. Um, Mark, you're not allowed to answer this. Matt, do you know what cin- cinema score is? D. No, D plus. Nice try. Um, you suck. All right. Um, I want to go over the best supporting actresses for 2018, and we can talk about maybe who shouldn't have been nominated over. Because do you guys think Tony Collette deserves a nomination for this? Absolutely, hundred percent, no question. Matt, do you? Yeah. Okay. So the winner was Regina King for Bill Street Could Talk. You yeah. had Amy Adams for Vice. Oh, God. Marina de Tavira for Roma. And then you had Emma Stone and Rachel Vise for The Favorite. Yep. Kick off Amy Adams. Kick off everything of that love for Vice. Kick, Kick off Amy off Adams. But... The movie was so overrated. <laughs> really? I haven't seen Roma, so I can't really talk about it. I'd say take off like Amy Adams. And if you don't, take off Rachel Vise for The Favorite. You know, you know what? Rain. I'd like to talk about Amy Adams for a second. I, well, how did she get a nomination for Vice, but she didn't get a nomination for Arrival? Because isn't that like, absurd? The Academy because, doesn't like good movies. Yeah. Because Tom, just Tom like Phillips, yeah. whatever his name is, paid off no, the Oscars. I think no, like Adam director. McKay. Adam McKay, McKay paid off directors. Do, do you like how Adam McKay tried to go from a 
comedy director to a serious director or is trying yeah. to and it's not working well speaking of adam mckay do you know what he's working on do, do i care what is it yeah you do care i think you both do care what is he, it if, if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure i'm not he's working with bong joon ho for that hbo limited series of parasite the american version uh, well, what wait 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 what why? wait wait is he there's, directing there's gonna the be series? As, okay, so here's what here's as far. Why are we I'm, getting I a miniseries of, of two? Bong Joon Ho. Bong Joon Ho had a lot of ideas for Parasite, and apparently, like you know, once American audiences love something, they just have to have their own version of it. You know, cute it's old like boy. It. <laughs> oh, <shut up. laughs> he, um, he clearly loved old boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh aren't they doing is has it been like they're an american version of the raid like in the works for a while yeah frank grillo is supposed to star in it the dude frank miller no frank grillo the dude who plays um crossbones and yeah american, captain america he, yeah he goes ah, i'm gonna kill you and when he has the suit on he's like i've been waiting for this and he punches captain america and I they're like gonna get paul grass to direct it and the directing's gonna be like this <laughs> <laughs> he's punching Gather him <laughs> um um i like but I like yeah and... so kick off yeah. amy adams um you're gone for vice so tony Clark gets a nomination in our 2018 best morning actress or 2019 um how long was the original cut of this movie three hours and 30 minutes two Sorry. hours and 50 minutes it was a little over three hours and you want to know what thing they were going to include more it was a ton more family dialogue so maybe that would have oh. fleshed out the ideas a little bit more i think i think this is like where um the test audience is coming to play because I just I just really hate the idea of a test audience. Yeah, you know it's just so com- it's like you have to force the director to compromise, and I just think it's you know look at a movie like Citizen Kane. Orson Welles had like been, was able to negotiate a contract so that he had complete power over the script and like the directing of the film, and you know you, you get this you know regarded as one of the best films in cinematic history. You know. So you know when we, again, when we give a director and then, free reign, and then he, we get something like Neon Demon. So I there's always a plus and there's a always a negative. That? There's a problem with that. Well, you know, when you, I when think, you get free reign, you get things like like um, too old, too old to die young. <laughs> now, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> Which I was waiting for the Man of Steel dig. So uh, I think for, I would have, I would love to see a director's cut. I mean, there's a there's a director's cut of Midsummer. <laughs> it's the 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 one that was released is like. Two hours and forty-five minutes. So I, don't have, I have no idea how long Ugh. the director's cut is. All right. Um, what scene? I got. I got two more. Uh, what scene? I want to get to the what we've been watching. So there's so much to talk about. Yeah, I know, but we're, we have to do this. It's a structured thing. Uh, I have two more. What scene did Alex Swift dislocate his jaw? In? I don't care. Just tell us. Uh, yeah, he uh, he actually wanted to really break his nose, but Ari Aster's like, I'm not letting you break your fucking nose, dude. And then yeah. so he instead dislocated his jaw. What a hero. Um, how many screenplays has Ari Aster wrote already that he wanted to direct? Two, uh, five. Uh, he, I, I know that he's written a lot of scripts. Uh, he's okay. Since he was a ten. teenager. Ten. Okay. Cool. Okay. So Matt. his next movie is a fantasy comedy. Apparently, okay. Matt. This is our structured thing. We're, I'm going to talk to you after. Comedy. I'm going to. I'm going to. Oh, uh, you're not going to talk to me after. <laughs> um, Shame on you. What was the box office and budget of this movie? Matt, don't look it up. I don't know. Twenty million and uh, forty million. 10 million budget, 80 million box office. It's on par. Oh, shit. The opening weekend was on par with something like the Vavitch. The Vavitch. So shut, shut, shut All your right. mouth. Grades. Um, if you don't know, if it's your first time, uh, we grade stuff on an A, B, C, D, F scale, no plus or minuses. So oftentimes you get stuff like me giving the Marina B or our unreleased uh, Dune episode. Um, which what? We'll, what? Um, what are you talking no, about? We're, we've already, uh, no, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Uh, where Mark gives a grade to a movie um, that we won't spoil. Mark, what do you give Hereditary? Uh, I give it an A. Big old fat A? Big old fat A. Matt, what do you give Hereditary? B. A B? I am also going to give Hereditary a B. It's a I like real... how I like how Mark's I, – I can never tell if Mark likes a movie or not because he gave Dune a B. So like an A, an A is basically meaningless now for him. It's like I'm like, did he hate it or like is he mediocre on it? I don't really know. <laughs> well, I give them. I have, I have no, I have no idea what you're talking about because we've never reviewed Dune. So. Yeah, we haven't True. reviewed Dune. Yeah, I had a, I had a premonition. Yeah, yeah. you knew yeah. what he was gonna think. You, you just know him yeah. so well. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What is this? A Tyler outro this time? Yes, your eyes and ears do not deceive you. This video, or at least this specific section of the video, is over. And if you wanted to know 
what happened to the what we've been watching section or what happened to the call to action or where you vote for your favorite film fraud or when we tease the next episode. Well, don't worry. The original recording of this hereditary episode was about an hour and a half long and we didn't want to give you guys a super long video. So we're actually deciding to split it up into two separate videos, the hereditary discussion and then the back 30 minute half of the what we've been watching and the stuff I just stated. We just wanted to split it up because it's a long episode. We didn't want to give you guys too much. But if you guys want to see the entire episode, it's in, if you guys want to see the episode in its entirety, it should be up on every single podcast app that you can find it on. Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google, uh, Google Podcast, every sort of thing. So, yep, this video should be out. And if you guys are at the end of this, the following day, the next part will be out. All right. Enjoy, guys. Enjoy, guys.